On behalf of the National Eczema Association, I'd like to welcome you all to our webinar Wednesday presentation, Pediatric Eczema, What Every Parent Needs to Know. I'm your host, Danny Morsehead. I am the Marketing and Communications Manager here at the National Eczema Association. And our presenters today are Harper Price, MD, and Pediatric Nurse Practitioner, Sam Castleman. Dr. Price is the Division Chief of Pediatric Dermatology at Phoenix Children's Hospital. And Sam Castleman is a Pediatric Nurse Practitioner in the Department of Dermatology also at Phoenix Children's Hospital. And with that, I am pleased to introduce our presenters. Thank you, Danny. All right, hopefully everybody can see my screen. So Sam and I are so delighted to join everyone tonight and be a part of uh, NEA and this webinar session, our lectures on pediatric eczema, what every parent needs to know. We do have some relevant disclosures that uh, we'd like to uh, take a minute to talk about. Myself, I do uh, investigational research and advisory work to Regeneron and Sanofi, which are both companies that participate in clinical trials and research in patients with eczema. But all my funds go to research um, at PCH or my research division. Sam um, is a Pfizer promotional speaker and also a Sanofi advisory board, advisory board consultant as well. So this lecture this evening is going to be uh, a basic introduction, but also with some advanced concept, concepts for those parents uh, to understand eczema from the, from the beginning um, and kind of give a broad overview of life with eczema, how to treat eczema, and what eczema is. But I hope for those of you that are actually already experts that you'll be able to pick up some, some new things as well. So it's really important when we talk about eczema that we all know what we're talking about. Eczema is a lay term that we use quite loosely, and in this lecture, I'm going to be using it to uh, essentially for atopic dermatitis, which is the medical term for eczema. Um, in, in the U.S. and other countries, atopic eczema is also a term that means the same things. And this is essentially referring to an itchy, chronic, inflammatory condition that waxes and wanes. It's often called the itch that rashes because uh, children and adults become itchy sometimes, actually many oftentimes, before you actually see a rash on the skin. And there are defined criteria to make the diagnosis of atopic dermatitis or eczema. So it's not just essentially looking at something uh, and saying, hey, that looks like eczema. There's, there's many things that as providers we keep in mind um, and a criteria that we refer to. What eczema isn't is also just as important as knowing what it is. So inherently itself, eczema is not a sign of a food allergy or a sensitivity. Uh, it, in less than 25% of the time, our patients with uh, food allergies presenting with uh, eczema as a, as, a, as a signal of that, it's oftentimes hives and swelling. It's also not a sign, a primary sign of contact or environmental allergies, although these things can contribute. Eczema in itself or atopic dermatitis is inherent and genetic, as we'll talk about. It's not psoriasis. These are two separate conditions. And it's not a skin infection, although we can see skin infections in patients with eczema quite frequently. It's not contagious, so often we talk about eczema spreading, spreading down the arms, spreading down the legs. It doesn't spread in the same way that an infection or a cellulitis would. It's just that new spots are coming up, and actually we know, based on science, that there are affected areas that we can't even see with our eyes, that when you biopsy um, those areas, there is inflammation under the skin. So skin infections, exposure, environmental things, and rarely foods can make eczema worse, but essentially they are not eczema or atopic dermatitis. And there are some things that mimic eczema, and I've got a few of them here, just so you're aware, because getting the important diagnosis, I have to stress, is my first main point, is make sure your child or you have the right diagnosis. So atopic dermatitis can look very similar to psoriasis up here in this, I'm not sure if you can see my, my mouse, I don't think you can, but up here with this child on the side of the scalp is psoriasis, and on the legs as well, there's a couple pictures of hives in the top right, and some scaling uh, round rashes that are what we call uh, tinea corporis or tinea fasciae, which is also the lay term for ringworm, or the, the lay term is ringworm that you might know, and contact dermatitis, often blistering, some things you might think of from poison ivy or poison oak, depending on where you live. And then the, we talked about swelling can be a sign of an acute allergy, like such as to peanuts, and those are all different from atopic dermatitis. So eczema tends to start early in life. Our most common patients that we see in our clinic are young babies, most commonly between two to six months of life. 
about 50% um, will develop um, eczema in the first six months and 90% develop by five years of age. So if we are seeing a new patient who's 13 who suddenly has eczema where they've never had eczema before, we're gonna be pretty skeptical about that diagnosis and make sure that there isn't anything else that could be um, have going on there. What infantile eczema looks like uh, is, is a little bit different as children grow up and become uh, teens and young adults. So in infants, we tend to see more of a facial predominance, especially the cheeks around the eyes. Um, there's often this sort of sparing of the central face of the nose and upper lip area. Cheeks touch, you know, the cheeks are have saliva, they have food on them, um, they're, they're rubbed on everything, so they're a very common area uh, and, and on, in a place that we tend to see the onset of eczema. But you'll also see on the extensors, so on the outside of the arms, on the outside of the legs, um, sometimes on the tummy, the scalp, um, the diaper area is often spared. That's very typical because there's a lot of moisture there, and so it doesn't get dry and cracked. As your child moves from to toddler to childhood eczema, essentially the eczema changes. So it's still atopic dermatitis, but it moves into the creases more. So the neck, the crooks of the elbows, behind the knees, under the arms, especially. Um, you can still have some on the face, especially around the eyes, uh, but that cheek eczema tend tends to go away. And so that often can be a nice thing for families to think about uh, when you get very frustrated with the eczema on the cheeks, but it does tend to morph into other areas. And this is just a very common sort of um, march of where eczema can go on the body. Not that you can't see it other places, but these are the most common areas, uh, and they actually help us to make the diagnosis. From adolescence to teens, um, the lesions become much more chronic. So these are still around the flexures, but we'll tend to see forehead involvement around the eyes, the neck, the lips, the wrists. Um, and this can be localized in any patients or generalized or widespread, which would be often more severe patients. Within eczema or atopic dermatitis itself, there are different types of eczema. Um, and so that can be very confusing. And you can have one type or your child can have one type and then pop up with another type. Uh, and that's often a, a hard thing to, to kind of grasp. Uh, and you have to be careful that you're getting, again, the right diagnosis. So on the top left picture here, you can see these kind of scaly white spots on this child's cheek. This is something called pityriasis alba. This is a type of mild eczema we tend to see in adolescents, uh, sort of older childhood, young adult. Often when the skin becomes tan, these spots don't tan, um, often confused with a fungal infection, something like that. It makes the skin look splotchy. It's often hardly ever itchy, doesn't bother the child, uh, but this is actually a very mild subacute form of eczema. The picture of the finger is something called dyshydrotic eczema. Those are little tiny blisters on the sides of the fingers and sometimes on the palms and soles, very, very itchy. I've seen this a few times um, you know, every year in, in children, but this is often more common in childhood and young adulthood. And then those uh, round kind of bumpy lesions, the small ones, this is called papular eczema, often a, a, skin type, a type of eczema we see in darker skin types. And then those round coin-like lesions in the bottom three photos, this is called numular eczema. This is particularly frustrating for everyone. These are very itchy, very chronic often get confused for ringworm or what we call tinea infections or psoriasis, can be very stubborn and often require strong topical medications. So what are the risk factors for your child developing atopic dermatitis? We know that family history of related atopic dermatitis or atopic condition plays a big part. So those conditions like asthma, eczema, and allergic rhinitis, which is the runny nose, allergic conjunctivitis, which is itchy allergy eyes, play a factor here. So if the child has one parent with atopic, has one pa parent with these conditions, the odds are two to three times higher that they will develop atopic dermatitis. With two atopic parents, you're talking three to five times higher. And 70% of our patients have at least one positive family member that has a history of these other atopic conditions. So we know that this is, this is hereditary, this is genetic. Um, there's also a specific gene called filagrin, which is a a gene that's responsible for holding water into the skin. And we know that this is a very common gene change or mutation in this gene that can, that can be passed down generations and generations. Um, it's actually a very common gene change. One in 150 to 200 people have this gene and it makes you more predisposed to these atopic conditions. And so that can play a part as well. So this is just an example, this little picture here of how uh, you have normal skin that keeps out allergens um, and um, important things that shouldn't get through your skin. And when you have eczema and a filarigan mutation, you get cracks in the skin surface and actually things like allergens get through and inflame and create an inflammatory response in your skin. 
So there are lots of other conditions that we actually can see associated with atopic dermatitis. These also help us make the diagnosis. You can have something called ichthyosis vulgaris, which is these dry, uh, scaly, plate-like lesions um, you can see here. This is, again, due to a filaggrin mutation. So we look for these changes on children and young adults. We look at the palms to see if they have lots of lines on them. We look, at, we look for this dry plate-like scale and a scaly scalp. These can be really helpful saying, wow, you have ichthyosis vulgaris, you're definitely going to be at much higher risk to have atopic dermatitis. We also see keratosis pilaris, which are these little um, tiny follicular-based bumps, follicle-based bumps on the cheeks and the arms, and in some cases can be very widespread onto the, the thighs and the back. Uh, pretty harmless, often not itchy, but can be very distressing to patients and families. This is also a sensitive skin type, uh, skin condition that um, can also be seen with patients with atopic dermatitis and ichthyosis vulgaris. We talked about pityriasis alba. Having inflammation at the corner of your lips and around your lips is called chelitis. That's an, often a common finding we see in young children um, and teens with atopic dermatitis and, and chronic atopic dermatitis. Oops, let's go back here. And then you saw these two uh, pictures on the top right. This is called parigo. These are very itchy, chronically itchy, thick and heaped up bumps. Um, that can develop in patients with long-standing atopic dermatitis and can be very, very difficult to treat. So what causes eczema? Essentially, we've already talked a little bit about this, uh, that barrier abnormality in the top layer of the skin. This is important if you think of the top layer of your skin as a brick wall, uh, and this keeps out chemicals, uh, environmental factors, keeps in heat, keeps in water, keeps out allergens. When you have this filaggrin mutation or other predisposition predisposing um, genes that have to do with eczema, it creates cracks in your barrier. And thus things can get in like allergens, peanut protein, and things can get out like water. And this creates a lot of skin inflammation and dysregulation of the immune system. What can also help happen as well is frequent bacterial colonization. That's having too many uh, numbers of abnormal bacteria that shouldn't live on our skin like Staph aureus, creating a problem and getting through that skin barrier when you have that infection there, those bacteria that aren't supposed to be there, they're also revving up your immune system to try to fight this infection when it really shouldn't be, we really don't want it revved up and seeing those types of things. So again, here's just a pictorial example. You've got some dry skin, uh, which is the one of the inherent causes and factors of atopic dermatitis. You're losing water because it's evaporating. Um, the mortar between the cells is weak and the skin begins to flake. Then you have the inflammatory cells that arrive and you see redness and inflammation and swelling, and that leads to itching in this. So when you look at eczema under the microscope, this is what you'll see on the right. Uh, so interestingly, I always tell families the word eczema means to boil over in Greek. Uh, and so essentially what we see in the skin is a lot of swelling or edema. So on the right side here, you can see an abnormal skin sample. And on the left side, you can see a normal skin sample. They look very different. So that epidermis or top layer of the skin is swollen, those cells are stretched, and there's lots of inflammation on the right, whereas on the left, everything looks pretty good, there's no swelling, there's no inflammation, that's normal skin histology. And that's what's going on in the acute phase of atopic dermatitis. With the um, atopic dermatitis comes this concept of atopic march, and what is that? You know, that's essentially this uh, process that's been described for a long time where early eczema leads to other allergic diseases like asthma, food allergies, and seasonal allergies. So we know that the earlier onset of atopic dermatitis, especially before age two, and having moderate to severe atopic dermatitis means that you're gonna more likely to develop allergic asthma and allergic rhinitis. And you know why is this? Well, there's a lot of modernization, a lot of industrialization, there's a lot more environmental exposures, outdoor pollutions. The diet is very different than it was you know, decades and hundreds of years ago. And the earliest part of this march that we've all thought about is food-mediated allergies. So essentially, you get exposed through foods through your skin barrier that isn't working correctly, and you become sensitized to these foods before even you may have even ingested them. Sorry about that. So what does this look like? Uh, bear with me, because this is a really cool diagram, and this is just a model. I want to say that. But essentially on the top, you see these little allergens um, could be environmental things, could be food or things in the air like pollens. They get through that skin barrier because it's damaged and um, get into the second layer of skin where we have these type of allergy cells called Langerhans cells. Those are kind of on alert for foreign invaders. They look at those things that aren't supposed to be getting through the top layer 
and they create a lot of havoc. So they activate other important cells here you can see in green in the dermis, which is our second layer of skin. And a lot of these cells have to do with allergy, mast cells, eosinophils. They get all revved up. They produce their little chemicals. The skin produces its inflammatory chemicals to try to combat these things getting through the skin. And we have a really inflamed immune system here. Those cells and those chemicals get into the circulation in our skin and then are brought into the broader circulation. So, our, so essentially our immune system is primed for these things that it shouldn't have actually ever seen. And that, those immune cells can go to your lungs where they may actually encounter these things in your lungs or in your gut where they may encounter these different foods that you were sensitized with through your skin. And so that can lead to allergic asthma, rhinitis, and food allergy, as well as the atopic dermatitis. And it's really not as simple as this. We think that atopic dermatitis is the first part of the march and then a food allergy, and then later on allergic asthma and allergic rhinitis, but this is still really being worked out. And we know uh, that there's a lot more to it. There's the microbiome in the gut and the skin um, and a lot of other genetic factors we just don't understand. But as we know it, this is a good model. So how do we prevent eczema? So now you know, wow, I have one child with eczema. You know, maybe you're considering having another child. How do I prevent this? It's called primary prevention, where someone may be at high risk to develop a condition or hasn't developed it yet, and you want to prevent that from occurring. Well, current evidence doesn't really allow for formal recommendations as to say, hi, you know, you can't, you know, I know you've had two children with eczema, you're going to have a third, here's what you need to do to prevent that. But we do have some rather decent evidence about, evidence about pre and probiotics during pregnancy or in the neonatal period. We also have some pretty good evidence about using emollients, which are thick moisturizers early in life, essentially at birth, to protect that barrier so that we're not sensitized to things through the skin barrier and can develop the proper micro, micro, microbiome of your skin and thus your gut, especially in high risk infants. And so there was a recent study kind of looking at all the studies that are out there about this topic. And they did sort of come up, um, this is the strongest evidence we have so far, it's called a systematic review or meta-analysis. They did come up with the recommendation that a mixture of probiotic supplements given during pregnancy and breastfeeding is probably most efficacious in reducing risk in children. Um, that's not you know, a formal recommendation that we generally make as pediatric dermatologists. We are not the experts in prenatal care. We're not obstetricians, we're not pediatricians. So I always recommend that you talk about that with the appropriate specialists. But this is the information that we have and I think it's worth knowing and talking about. And so the latter part of my half, quickly, I'm gonna go through treatments and specifically topical anti-inflammatory medications and systemic medication. Then Sam's gonna finish up with some of the other ways to treat eczema and some of the other uh, triggers and exacerbating factors. So we talked about skin hydration and barrier repair as being really important to repair that barrier. Controlling infection is really important. You heard that that infection is a big part of what can drive eczema. And now I'm gonna talk about topical anti-inflammatory medications. And these four things are really key. You cannot leave part of this out in our opinion. I know Sam agrees with me when you're trying to treat an infant or child with eczema or a teen, because these all go together. And so anti-inflammatory medications you know, most commonly we're talking about topical corticosteroids, um, but we also have things called TCIs or topical calcineurin inhibitors and other newer topical anti-inflammatory medications such as crisoborol. And this is really tackling that inflammation part of this pathway that we talked about. And then when patients are more moderate to severe, we consider more what we call systemic treatments that are taken you know, either orally or, or injections or phototherapy, which is the light box. Topical corticosteroids or topical cortisones or steroids, as you may hear, remain the first line of treatment. Uh, you know, unfortunately, I had I wish I had a different thing to offer. Um, you know, when these are used uh, safe and appropriately, there's a very low risk of side effects. These are essentially for your flare plan. So your child flares up. These are what you tend to use twice a day. In our opinion, this is what Sam and I do until clear, and we avoid using these topical steroids on the normal healthy skin. You should, your doctor should be choosing the appropriate strength for the location and how bad the eczema is. And then you may be asked to transition to something called a maintenance routine when things are clear or better. As a parent or as a, an older child where you're actually maybe doing some of your own care, things that you wanna really think about is you know, when and where do I treat my eczema? So you wanna look, you wanna look at the skin and see if you see rough skin, inflammation, redness, pink, something abnormal that indicates eczema. You wanna feel and touch, especially if you're taking care of an infant or a young child. Sometimes you can't see redness as well, especially in darker skin types, it can be difficult, but feeling the skin, can, it can feel rough, it can feel bumpy. That can be a big indication that you need to treat that area. And then observe or ask about itchiness. Ask your child or observe your infant 
they're rubbing on things, they're moving, they're twitching, they're not sleeping well. These are all things that indicate these areas um, or your child needs to be treated. TCIs or topical calcium and urine inhibitors is another class of topical medications that have been out for gosh, about 20 years. These are steroid free options. There's pimicrolimus and there's tacrolimus. Um, these both have different indications, but they are not approved below the age of two, although they have very good evidence. I will tell you down to two to three months of age, particularly for pimicrolimus, they're just not approved that way. And these are really used as second line treatment especially on areas like eyelids, face, and groin, where you don't want to continue to use steroids or steroids where you have higher risk of, of side effects, or for chronic therapy, so where you need to keep your child clear or during a maintenance period. And these are great for these. Um, the one problem with these is that they can be, they can cause burning and stinging and, and sometimes like a warm feeling when they're applied. So we will often teach parents and patients how to mitigate this by you know, mixing with Vaseline, putting it in the refrigerator, but these do not cause skin thinning, stretch marks, or local effects, and these do not systemically immune suppress your child. Um, there is no increased risk of malignancy, even though there's a black box warning that's been disproven and is technically not a worry. These are often these are also six times less absorbed than topical steroids. So, although there is often a worry about these from the pharmacy standpoint, the data today, after 20 years of use and millions and millions of patients, is that these are very safe. These are actually some of my most favorite medications to use. They can be expensive and insurance may not always cover them, so they can create hurdles for us. Crisoborol uh, is, is a uh, newer ointment. Um, it was the first topical treatment we've had in over a decade in the past few years. It's now approved down to two months and up, so it is a medication that we have in very low age range. Like the other ones I talked about, the TCIs, these are safe for these areas like the face and the groin and skin folds, and also for longer term use. They're indicated for mild to moderate eczema, and they have a totally different anti-inflammatory mechanism. You know, this is, you know, uh, it, there are some downsides and upsides to this medication. Um, downsides is, again, just like the others, it's costly, it can be hard to access, and it stings and burns a little bit more, I think, and Sam and I have the same opinion than the other TCIs that we talked about. And it also takes a long time to see results. So this is not going to be a rescue medicine. This is going to be mostly a maintenance medication and something to uh, use after you've calmed down a flare but it's steroid free. There's no location restri restriction. So that can be, you know, very, um, you know, kind of stress relieving for patients and families not to have to think about, you know, that you can only put it certain areas. It helps a lot with itching. Um, and that can be really, really important. Even though the eczema doesn't go away that fast, the itching relief can be quite substantial. And now uh, dupilumab for childhood and adolescent. This is a super exciting, my favorite slide. This is the first uh, quote unquote biologic for atopic dermatitis and for pediatric AD itself. And now is approved for ages six and up and hopefully soon even lower. And this indication is for um, uncontrolled moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. These are patients that should be candidates for those stronger medicines I talk about, those oral medicines, those phototherapy medications, and patients specifically that have failed a lot of the stronger topical steroids and don't have anywhere to go topically. The nice thing is this is not considered immunosuppressive. What does that mean? That it's not gonna increase your risk of getting every cold and flu out there um, you know, and, and things like that. And it can be used with the topical steroids. There's no screening blood work. So even though this is an injection, like some of our other injectable medications like methotrexate, children have to get blood work every couple of months. This one, it's not needed. There's no routine blood work needed or screening blood work. And it's weight-based dosing and is a subcutaneous injection, so into the skin. So very exciting. Uh, just briefly how this works, this inhibits two specific pathways called IL-4 and IL-13. Those tend, that tends to be a pathway specific for uh, eczema inflammation, or we call it type 2 inflammation. This also affects um, our response to parasitic infections. So we do want to make sure when we give this medication that patient doesn't have an active parasitic infection. Luckily, in our country, that's not that common. Um, you know, other side effects we might see with this include irritation of the eyes, we call conjunctivitis, having a pain at the injection site or a little swelling, and very rarely having an allergic reaction. But you know, generally, we don't see an increase in skin infections. Um, this can make children feel better with their atopic dermatitis and their asthma. So please don't stop children's asthma medications. If they get a lot better on this medication, please speak to your allergist. And as of now, we cannot give uh, live vaccines on this medication. Hopefully, we'll have more guidance on that later. Uh, but that would tend to be not our patients um, six and up, because you should have had most of your live vaccines back then, unless you're before then, unless you're on a different schedule. And my last slide, Sam. Um, what about available over-the-counter products? 
Um, you know, this is a slide that I, I put in this year because we get a lot of questions about, well, I've tried everything, I've tried everything over the counter. How do I use these over-the-counter products in, you know, in, in my child's regimen? Um, generally, we don't tend to use a lot. Um, hydrocortisone 1% ointment or cream is out there, and for very mild eczema, it can work quite well, but make sure you're not getting those um, over-the-counter, you know, formulations that have a lot of extra ingredients like aloe and lavender. And oh, we want to avoid those extra ingredients because of that, um, you know, impaired skin barrier. There are a lot of over-the-counter anti-itch products, especially newer now. Everything with eczema says anti-itch or itch relief. We generally don't recommend topical Benadryl or Calamine or Sarna because again, these can be stingy, stingy. They have a lot of preservatives and you increase your risk for de developing a skin allergy to these. And then the one thing we do use commonly that can be available over the counter is sedating and non-sedating antihistamine. So that's like Benadryl, Allegra, Zyrtec, Claritin. Although they're not necessarily really recommended to treat eczema in the eczema guidelines that we have as doctors and providers, they definitely help some children who are flared by outdoor allergies and seasonal allergies, and they can help your child sleep. Um, and these are again available. So these are some of the things we do sometimes recommend uh, along with a mild hydrocortisone if your child's really, really mild, but generally we're using prescription products. And with that, Sam, I'm gonna um, let you take over here and give you keyboard and mouse. Thanks everybody for joining tonight. Let me make sure that I can move us along. I would like to cover the second part of what's most important with managing your eczema, which first starts with managing triggers. So avoiding your triggers can be easier said than done. Sometimes just being alive may trigger you, it seems like, but there are common triggers that most people would need to be careful with. And some common triggers include just being dry. So the number one treatment for eczema is moisturizing the skin. And having dry skin can be a really large trigger. I know I have some parents that are probably like, yes, amen, I know. I wish my kid would moisturize their skin or I, they don't like me to moisturize them. So I have some tips and tricks that I can share with you a little bit later. And there's also a lot of um, irritants. So I'm not going to go through the list. It's definitely not exhaustive. There could be many other things that are triggers. However, there are certain, um, what I want to point out are chemicals, chemicals and different products that can touch our skin that can cause issues. So metals are namely one of them. I personally have a lot of contact allergens to metals, to fragrance, to aloes, and so to beeswax. There's a lot of things that I've developed over time, and those types of reactions are actually a delayed reaction that you can develop over time, especially imagine now we're talking about this impaired skin that has the ability to absorb things, and by being impaired, if you put things on the skin that can absorb and over time create an allergy, then you're also adding an additional issue on top of just your normal dry skin and atopic dermatitis and moving into contact dermatitis. So let me make sure that I am moving over here. Harper, I don't see it um, moving where I can advance. Try it now, Sam, and see. There we go. Where is the little... <laughs> it goes away, oh. I know. Yeah, I don't see the, you'll have to advance for me. We can go to the next okay. slide. Okay, let me, Um, it kind of, it's not on me anymore, so let's see. <laughs> Hang on. There we go. Okay. So identifying triggers, we talked about um, foods, like Harper mentioned, um, if it's a specific response to a specific food, you should pay attention. However, just generally foods um, and food groups can be very uncommon for worsening eczema. I always ask my patients to pay attention to um, their gut. So if you're eating, feeding your baby a certain food and they're having a lot of um, like bloody stools, their tummies are really uncomfortable, they're throwing up a lot, they need to pay attention to those foods. But otherwise, it may not be something that is really clear, um, clear cut that it is causing worsening eczema. It's really hard to measure that. When we talk about aero allergens, that's just simply things that are in the air. So think about your blade plugins, think about the different diffusers that people can have. You may feel that your home is really safe, but what about the daycare? What about the office staff who have a diffuser at their desk and your child always likes to go and say hi and hug that person. Of course, you wouldn't want them to not do that. Um, however, 
you need to be almost like an auditor for your life and notice if there are certain things that are in the air that could be causing your child a flare. A lot of places are also using these sprayed chemicals to spray down fabrics afterwards. So um, that's something to keep in mind too. And um, kind of ask the staff at your children's school or preschool, are they using a product that sprays that may be irritating? And if you're noticing eyelid dermatitis um, and rashes, um, especially down on like the bottom of the face and the neck, then that could be a cue that you've got an arrow allergen causing you a problem. And then um, really paying attention to your personal care products. So the last slide, if you guys go back and reference it, has some items on there, some kind of crazy weird ingredient names. And those are the things that we worry about that can cause you issues with developing a true contact allergy. And when you develop a contact allergy, you would go through something called patch testing, which is different than the testing that you would do for foods. For foods and environment, you would go through skin prick testing. Um, and they may back it up with some blood testing to confirm um, that you have a problem with a food allergy or environmental allergy. But the picture that you see is actually a picture of one of our patients going through patch testing. We put these patches that have 10 different little wells um, in them, and then we put little dollops of ingredients, um, and then we place it on the child's back, and we leave that on for three days, take it off, and then actually five days later is when you can see a reaction. So. Remember that if you get um, an allergy to a peanut, that's an immediate reaction. But when you get an allergy to a skincare product and a chemical, an ingredient or a metal, that's a delayed reaction. So you could wear earrings on a Saturday and then you could develop the highest peak of that rash about five days later. So something to keep in mind and something that I feel a lot of patients aren't aware of. And there are many ingredients that you could accidentally be using on your child that are a top 10 contact pediatric um, allergen. So uh, happy to go through any questions that you guys may have at the end about that. Next is um, just general good daily management. And I know that you could probably have a home health person come in and do all of this for you uh, because it's just so strenuous, but I'd like to set you up with a few things. So there's a lot of writing on my slides, but there's key things that I always talk to my patients about. So it's really important to think, uh, think about sealing in your skin with a moisturizer or an ointment. That way, when you are taking a bath, we do condone baths daily, just with the right skincare product. When you get out of the bath and you should pat dry the skin, put your medication on first. That's a question I get a lot, which uh, routine and sorry, which order do you put things in? So you would always get out and put the medication on first. Then you put your moisturizer everywhere else. And we have this three minute rule. So get the kiddo out of the bath or the shower, don't let them run around like my kids do and then therefore evaporate the water out of their skin and therefore can become drier. Get them out, pat them dry, put your medicine on, put your moisturizers on to lock everything in, that soak and seal concept. Just imagine that you're just lathering them up in everything possible because you're wanting to hold in that moisture into in their um, skin. You can go to the next slide. Bathing is a really hot topic, I'd say, um, in all beads derm clinics, because a lot of you may have been told to not bathe your children, and children can be dirty. You need to bathe them every day, but do you need to clean them with a soap every day? Does it need to be every single place on the skin? If you have a baby and you guys didn't even go anywhere, we don't need you to vigorously scrub every inch of your baby. Um, but we do want you to think about doing a warm water soak daily, again, to get that hydration into the skin. And then when you clean the skin, I want you to choose a non-soap um, cleanser. The buzzwords that you'll see on those um, products will be liquid cleanser, and you'll notice that they don't suds up. So they don't suds up because they don't have these surfactants that make those suds and bubbles in the skincare products. Those can be irritating and drying. You could also change the pH of the skin so that would therefore make the skin drier, but it's a cleanser. So it still cleans the skin, but it will be quite watery uh, to where you may feel like you didn't use anything at all because you don't see the suds and, and bubbles like you're used to. But focus on cleaning the areas that need to be clean and do that every day. Because uh, like Dr. Price talked about, there are problems with skin infections that like to take the opportunity to cause an issue when your child is scratching their skin so much. So it is really important to clean um, the skin daily on areas that it needs and not ignore and let that skin build up and um, that your child to scratch staph bacteria into their skin, which can cause skin infections and then complicate your treatment. 
There are specific bath treatments that I wanted to list here for you. You could find a lot of this information on the NEO website. Um, I don't condone necessarily that you buy all of these things. Every single patient will like different things. Um, at least that you know that there's options. And the thing that I always talk about in my clinic to every single patient is going to be the little bleach bath. So I get a lot of crazy looks um, that come my way. Sometimes my patients will see another provider in my office and they'll say, they talked about bleach baths and I thought that they were crazy. And I'm going to say, well, I'm going to talk about them too, because I think that they could be really helpful. And the reason why I think that they're helpful is because of two things. It helps with inflammation, which can help with itching. And it also can help with bacteria. So because we talked about the inflammation and the itching and the, <clears throat> the problem with uh, that bacteria causing a skin infection, why not do something that could possibly help that? Um, something that doesn't require one of the medications that we talked about before. And I simply ask my patients, do, do you think that they help? And a majority of the time, parents say that they do. Uh, I live in Arizona, so we can go swimming every single day in Arizona. You do have to follow the same rules. You have to rinse off with clean water, do moisturizers. If you are swimming um, in a pool, chlorine pool, then you rinse off the same thing with the bleach baths, you rinse off afterwards. Uh, and so if you can do swimming every day in a chlorine pool, then you could do bleach baths every day if it's a time where you're not swimming. We think of it as a really similar concentration to chlorine pools. Uh, remember that if you get thrown into a chlorine pool, your hair is not going to bleach out, your skin's not going to bleach out, and the recipe that we give you is just the same. Uh, so next slide, please. I see a poll. I'm not sure what that was. That'd be kind of cool. Yeah, answer the poll if you saw it <laughs> about the bleach baths. I, I'm always curious who uses them. Um, the second key thing to pull out of um, this part of my talk is which moisturizers to use. So we categorize them in um, kind of their thickness and then what they're made up of. So ointments are going to be your friend during a flare. You may have noticed that when your child is flaring that even over the counter creams will sting their skin. And that's because creams and lotions are made with preservatives like alcohol that allow them to stay preserved. However, that even in an over-the-counter product can really sting the skin. So I always ask my patients to do ointments when they're flaring and then choosing a thicker cream when they're not flaring. So kind of your more everyday moisturizer is one of those, uh, the skin berry repair creams at the bottom. I am a big proponent for using products that have ceramides in them. Ceramides are those missing proteins in dry skin. So when you choose a product that has a ceramide in them, then it's actually getting more uh, deeper into the skin barrier, helping that dryness to be uh, calmed and, and healed uh, at the lower level where that brokenness and those missing proteins that Dr. Price reviewed are needing repair. So your everyday moisturizer, including something that has a ceramide in it, and then your more intensive therapy would be your ointments. And I do also condone that you use pumps rather than tubs. So if you have a tub of Vaseline, for example, and you keep dipping your fingers into the Vaseline to place it on your kiddo, remember they could have staph bacteria on their skin. So you either need to be using a tongue depressor or something that doesn't put your fingers into the product or buy something in a squeeze tube or with a pump. There's also um, other lotions and creams, um, but the, the two that I like to talk about the most are products that are thick with a ceramide and also uh, ointment. You'll bounce between the two depending on if you're treating flaring skin or if you're treating healthy skin. And the nice thing is that NIA has um, gone through and created a seal of acceptance. So if you haven't navigated to the NIA website, I highly encourage you to look at the seal of acceptance and see if there's a product that works for you in your budget as well as something that is um, approved by NIA and what they feel is uh, safe to use on your skin that won't trigger uh, your eczema. A couple key things out of moisturizing is that cold things feel good on the skin. So I unfortunately had a, an all-you-can-eat buffet on my arm from a mosquito the other night while I was lying in bed and woke up from intense itching on my arm. So I've been scratching that thing for the past few days and something that really helps to calm down that itching is cold. So I'll go grab a piece of ice and hold it on top of my mosquito bites 
And even though it's only temporary, it really helps me to not continually dig at my skin, cause more problems, cause it to be big and swollen and red. And the itching, as many of you know, whether you live with eczema or you see your kids, it is that this itch scratch cycle gets vicious. So even your cold, um, keeping things in the fridge could be really helpful to help with that itch sensation. So it's not typical that your medications would be um, good to put in the fridge, but think about your moisturizers, think about your ointments. The other thing that I'm a, a big proponent of as a mom is that you put these products in areas that are convenient. So if you have a school-age child or a teenager and you're trying to get them to do these treatments on their own, set them up in the best way possible. If they sit at the TV or sit at wherever they um, are normally in your house, then keep the moisturizers there. Don't necessarily keep them in the bathroom where it's not gonna be as likely that they'll use them. If you live somewhere where you could keep them in the car, keep them there for a little bit in your purse to remind them to do it. Next slide, please. I'm gonna breeze through wet wrap therapy. Just know that it is a treatment that we recommend for our patients. We normally would recommend it in either focal areas like the wrist or the ankle or the knees because it is a treatment that's designed to help those medications penetrate better into the skin, help the ointments to penetrate and help more with moisturizing the area, but it does make your topical steroids stronger. So you can certainly do wet wraps without the medications. However, in our clinic, we're often talking to you about doing these for more moderate to severe plaques that need focal treatment um, in a more aggressive manner. So if you have been directed to do topical steroids with your wet wraps, typically I tell my patients, I wouldn't want you to do this more than two to four days in the month without me knowing. And that's definitely not, they would be fine if they did it more. However, I don't want to plant the seed that you could do these for two weeks out of the month and then you come back to me four months later and have been doing that practice. That could be um, dangerous in a way depending on what topical steroid you're using and how much um, body surface area you're covering up. So you can find um, helpful infographics on Mia on how to do butt wraps. So I would say that these are kind of top things um, that would be really helpful if you haven't thought of them before when you go to your appointments to treat your kiddo's eczema. So know when the appointments are and coming back bringing your medications with you to the visit, or if you can't bring everything, including even the moisturizers and products that you use to wash the skin, just take a picture of the front and back. I oftentimes will go through uh, Google and find products and then look at the ingredients to make sure there's none of those contact allergy ingredients in there. One thing I've noticed is that refills is, are very challenging um, to pick up. So Walgreens may do something different than a CVS. Um, you may need to hold on to those uh, prescription numbers, which are kind of obscure and you'd never remember those. Uh, but it is really common that patients will come back and even though we've provided refills, they haven't filled them. So knowing how to pull refills from your pharmacy or even just setting it up on an automatic um, send to your house would be really helpful. Write down your questions beforehand. A lot of times we're in the clinic visit, maybe unfortunately it's nap time for your kiddo. Everybody's a little flustered, they're hungry. I'm hungry, the kiddo's screaming, and all of your questions that you thought out really well um, didn't get asked, and then you don't feel comfortable maybe calling and asking afterwards. So write them down and bring them with you. Or even bring a helper if your healthcare facility allows for extra people. Right now, um, I could say that ours do not allow anyone extra, but we do have an iPad or encourage our families to call family members especially ones that are taking care of the kiddos, maybe a grandma's at home and taking care of them during the day for you. You should call and include them uh, and virtually in that appointment. They'll need to hear the instructions as well. Also, it's really important to start helping to integrate how can my child start to treat their eczema independently. So talking about future plans as well as long-term and how your child can help um, and that shared decision-making concept and helping them to feel empowered on how to treat their eczema can be really valuable and obviously can relieve some stress on you guys as parents. There are some more things to consider. 
there are certain risk factors that are associated with long-term atopic dermatitis. This isn't, this isn't exhaustive, this isn't necessarily specific, but there are some things that if you're reading this and maybe you have a seven-year-old and wondering like, oh, I wonder if they're gonna have more of this long-term eczema or if they're gonna grow out of it, here's some things to consider. So if you've had eczema start um, at the onset of age two and older, if you have um, a high severity of atopic dermatitis when they developed it, a history of very persistent atopic dermatitis that's been really difficult to treat. Unfortunately, our ladies are gonna have a little bit higher risk according to studies. The association with asthma may mean that your kiddo can continue with eczema. And we don't necessarily test for filaggrin mutations, but the having filaggrin mutation would mean that it might be a higher risk for you to continue to have problems with eczema. But it's important to remember that that journey should be in a trusting relationship with your healthcare provider. There are medications that we have, there's new medications that are coming out. And I find that it's really common that our most frustrated patients have bounced between multiple different providers, hearing multiple different opinions, and find somebody that you really trust, form that relationship and stay with them. That shared decision-making process is super valuable when it comes to the care for eczema because Many patients do outgrow it, but there are uh, about 20% of patients who can continue it into their adulthood. And what I like to focus on in my clinic is optimizing quality of life because sleep disturbances, itching, mental health issues, and other health conditions that accompany atopic dermatitis can be really quite exhausting and overwhelming. We have learned that AD isn't curable. We can't cure those genes that make you more susceptible to having that dry skin barrier, more of those atopic conditions, but there are things that we can focus on as a team to make life right again. Itching, I think, is one of the number one things to try to stop for your eczema patients. That is certainly easier said than done. Makes sense that the worse that you itch, the worse your quality of life may be. And our clinic uh, psychologist who joins us for our comprehensive allergy and dermatology clinic provided these slides below with different tips as a parent that you could do to help your child to alleviate their itch. Distraction, redirection, relaxation, self-hypnosis, cognitive coping. There's a great TED talk on itch. Uh, different videos and resources, especially with Nia. Um, so I would encourage you to hone in. If you have one key thing to take away from here, you feel like you know all of the management strategies, but your child really has problems with itching, then maybe see if there's some new techniques that you can utilize for them. Because if we don't stop the itch, then it's going to be really hard to stop that eczema flare. Using cold things that we talked about before can be really helpful. Using sedating medications because we are medically trying to help your child to get quality sleep. Um, a lot of parents in my clinic have a guilty feeling about using sedative medications. They feel that they're trying to drug their children to make them go to sleep because they want good sleep. Well, guess what? Everybody needs good sleep. And unfortunately, atopic dermatitis is such an itchy skin condition that it can keep people awake partially so, to where they're only getting a mild, um, restful night of sleep. And we all know that we need good quality nights of sleep. So sedating medications are really common for us to talk about in our clinic because we need that child to get restful sleep, not where they're partially awake and scratching and causing bleeding on their sheets. Cognitive behavioral therapy is just one type of therapy that you can consider. It would be with a behavioral health specialist like a counselor or with a psychologist. The things to keep in mind when you're trying to find a provider like that is to focus on a pediatric provider. They may offer services like play therapy or the CBT. Helping them with distraction and helping family coping is something that's really valuable for our AD patients. Seventy percent of children with AD experience sleep loss. There is an average that children can experience up to 162 nights per year with disturbed sleep. That's almost half of the year that your child may sleep with disturbed sleep. If you're a parent here, then we've all had those restless nights of sleep as a newborn parent, but imagine that that continues for us throughout our whole life. So it's really important to help our kids with the sleep. And how we can do that is create good sleep hygiene techniques, 
the dating medications, um, and taking it in a stepwise approach. Maybe you start with Benadryl, like we talked about in the over-the-counter options, but then if your provider gave you something like Adirax to try, then don't be afraid of it. There are certain medical conditions that can um, come about from this poor sleep that we're finding, um, that researchers in eczema are finding out, and, and that can be really devastating for your child, um, and we will go over those in just a second here. Anxiety and depression is unfortunately a comorbidity or another um, problem and result that's secondary to your child's eczema from their constant itching, scratching, and their coping. But if you notice, this top line is actually that parents of children who have atopic dermatitis can have higher anxiety and depression. Your kiddos are stressed out. You're stressed out trying to manage them. And so if anything, just to affirm or acknowledge that these things um, can become serious, if untreated and left to be itchy your whole life, then that can cause some problems. It can also affect um, school. So in a study of 658 children with AED, it showed that 20% of those children miss school. So you'll want to talk to your school if you're raising your hand and thinking, oh yeah, my kid has to miss a lot of school. You'll want to talk to your school about an IEP or a 504 plan. If you don't know what that is, and you would simply ask the school, they certainly know what it is. And it's accommodations for your child because of their medical conditions. Unfortunately, research around um, children with AD and their mental health also show that their social and peer relationships suffer. You may notice that your child doesn't like to wear short shorts, um, uh, short sleeve shirts when they're having a flare because their skin may be dispigmented, they may have rashes all over them. And when they're doing well, you may notice that children are more um, in clothes that are appropriate, maybe even just for the weather. So a kid that may be in the summertime wearing like sweatshirts and, and long sleeves, um, long, long pants, uh, once they have good treatment, then um, some of my patients at least have expressed that even parents will notice that the children will wear different clothing when their AD is well controlled. Next. So I'm a big proponent of advocating, advocating for yourself. So unless you guys live here in Arizona and can come see us and you're gonna need to be the best advocate that you can be for your child with eczema. There's this concept of shared decision-making. Mia has an app that you can utilize that helps to show your providers how your child's eczema is doing, how it ebbs and flows. Um, it's an app that will help them understand how the eczema is going um, outside of just that one time in the clinic uh, for the clinic appointment. Um, also utilize the support staff. So I always encourage our patients to call our nurses. When I was a nurse for our department before becoming a nurse practitioner, it was really valuable for me once I got into the provider role because I would hear the questions that parents would call and ask about. They were really scared about bleach fast. Maybe they went to the pharmacy and the pharmacist told them that the medications that we gave them were really strong and there was a day um, limit that they were able to use them, but we never talked about a limit in time. So call and ask um, some follow-up questions from the support staff. They're there to support you, to help you understand that treatment plan. Um, we've talked now for almost an hour and that's how much this information that we went over here, maybe not in such great detail, is also what we tend to go over with our new eczema patients. And, you may be thinking right now, gosh, I'm holding on to a few key things here and it makes sense while I'm explaining it to you, but then you leave this webinar and you're like, oh man, I forgot everything. Luckily you have the PowerPoint presentation to go back and look at. That's the same situation with your clinic visits. Get patient education information and call and talk to the staff so they can help you understand how to manage your child's eczema. There's definitely different tools and eczema action plans that are available and being connected in community. So Nia, um, I love volunteering with this organization because they've created a great community for parents and kids to feel like you're supported and affirmed in the issues that you're having in managing your child's eczema. So with that, we wanna say thank you, most of all for coming and open it up for questions. Thank you. Thanks to you both for your presentations and all the information you provided here. Um, let's see here. We're, we're going to get through um, as many questions as we can. And so I'll just kick us right off. First question, did my child get eczema because I let his skin get too dry? 
So uh, in the beginning of the presentation, that's a great question. It, it's not your fault. Uh, Sam and I often say that it's, it's not your fault. This is genetics and environment and a lot of things that we can't control. Uh, so, you know, it, it, a lot of times with newborns, you're given different guidance about, you know, use this, use that. You get sent home with different moisturizers from the nursery. We do recommend, you know, moisturizing, especially high risk children, um, you know, day one. But if you didn't know that, it's, it's again, it's not something that you can do anything about at this point. It is not your fault, I would say. It's, it's a lot of things are out of our control and we're just learning more about these things. So what you can do now is moisturize and take this information that Sam and I have given you and, and kind of utilize those tools. All right, we have two more here. My four-year-old hates taking baths, even washing his hands sometimes because he says they hurt. What can I do? It's very hit or miss in my opinion when it comes to using something like the oatmeal um, in the bath. I would say that more often patients of mine say that it's irritating. Kids get out of the bath and their skin is more red and inflamed. I would do maybe a mixture of a dilute bleach bath with the right recipe. Mia has different um, handouts that you can look at to make sure that the recipe is right adding some um, baking soda and even like um, making sure also I guess first step that you're treating the eczema appropriately with your medications so that his skin has a chance to actually calm down be calm before you go in the water but kind of neutralizing the waters with the baking sodas and distractions so like fun toys um, there's also like little tabs that you can buy on Amazon that add color to the bath I've asked um, experts that have um, that study different contact allergens if those types of ingredients are potentially irritating or um, can develop that allergy for kids with eczema and they didn't think that those color bath tablets would be a problem. Um, so making it fun and distracting, um, maybe pull out like rewards and things to really tease out is this truly something that's stinging their skin or is this just their power struggle with you and they're able to win that struggle and keep the power with not taking baths. Yeah, and I would I would add to that too. Those are great strategies that when you you can get in the bath with your moisturizers on. So it may seem redundant, but in order to sort of get your child used to that, um, row bath oil is a vanny cream product that I really like. I don't recommend it a ton because I often don't need it, but that's an oil you can put in the bath or on your child's skin before they get in. And if your skin barrier, you know, if your skin is protected with Vaseline or whatever, um, when you get in the bath, you don't feel the water. So just to get them used to it, you could sort of slowly work your way up is actually put a moisturizer on a little bit right before the bath and then get, let them get in and know it's not gonna hurt and, and inch their way in with just a toe or a foot and let them play on the side of the bath. Uh, but there are lots of little techniques and Sam said too, uh, pool salt tabs can also help uh, neutralize stinging of water and in using a really good uh, you know psychologist or, or a, a social worker that's really good with cognitive behavioral therapy and coaching can be really helpful too this is not an uncommon problem you're not definitely not alone a lot of our families have this issue mm -hmm. all right last question here what are the new treatments you mentioned are they going to be available for children if not now when might they be available and what are the risks yeah, so they're a little bit too early to talk about in the pediatric age group. I can give you some general examples. They're definitely being studied in um, teenagers with atopic dermatitis as well as adults. So there are oral medications called JAK inhibitors, J-A-K or JAK stat inhibitors. Um, I know that they spoke with about them at the NIA meeting recently at the Eczema Expo. These are another type of anti-inflammatory or immune um, modulator uh, treatment that's been really, really helpful both topically and orally that we're starting to look at um, for eczema, but they've been using other types of conditions in adults for, for some time. And then there's other biologics uh, similar to Dupixin. There are other um, you know, uh, injectable medications along that same pathway that are targeting specific um, chemicals or cytokines that um, cause or contribute to eczema, and even one for itch, an anti-IL-31 medication that's probably not gonna be it, it, it by itself alone a, a a, a, a sole treatment, but can really be an adjuvant treatment for patients with itch. And then there's some other novel um, small molecules, some topical medications as well. But remember, we do test these all on adults um, for a reason because, um, you know, they, they, adults and kids are different. We have to test them separately. And once we get good, safe adult data, then we're very careful to introduce them to older kids and then younger kids. And so we want to do this safe. Kids can react different and have different side effects. So as anxious as we all are to to use these medications, 
Um, we want to make sure we do it safely and properly. And I think this is a really cool time. I want to leave you all with a bit of hope that I think in the next 10 years, this field is going to explode with different therapeutic options um, that are going to be super, super helpful. So stay tuned and stay in touch with Nia and with your eczema experts. Thanks to you both for this presentation for helping us get a better understanding of pediatric eczema. You may register for an upcoming webinar or watch the recording of a previous webinar at nationaleczema.org slash webinar dash Wednesdays. Once again, I'm Danny Morsehead on behalf of the National Eczema Association. Thank you for joining us. Thank, Thank you. you.